that's it. I mean, Jocelyn like she's not coming. So no, no, no. Like, Jocelyn is going to crawl over Gordon, but she's out there because they're. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Madame. Good evening, everyone. So exciting being together again. I'm Kate Markert. I'm executive director here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens, and it is a real delight for me to welcome you here for tonight's lecture, which of course is the first in our series of four about the firm of Fabergé. And tonight we're going to hear from Hillwood's very own Wilfred Zeisler. And a special welcome to those of you in simulcast in the CW Post room. But you know what I'm going to say now. Before we continue, maybe you've forgotten it's been a while. Um, please take a moment to silence your phones or anything else that makes noise or chirps or barks or whatever they do. <laughs> so tonight we celebrate the exhibition Fabergé Rediscovered, which unveils new discoveries relating to Hillwood's Fabergé collection, along with sensational loans from all over the world. So over the next few weeks, we'll take, take a deeper look at the firm of Fabergé and each of our internationally known speakers joining us from St. Petersburg or London will explore a different aspect of this storied firm. From its technological and artistic innovations to the glittering London shop. That's our grand finale. <laughs> Next week on Wednesday, October 10th, we'll be treated to a talk by our great friend Caroline DeGuito. I know many of you have already signed up for that. She's the Senior Curator of Decorative Arts at the Royal Collection Trust in London, and of course she's the Queen's Keeper of Fabergé. It's written lots of books. She's great. As you are all well aware, I'm sure, I know there's, I know there's one of you who's not a member, but I know many of, uh, and you know who you are, right? Yeah, right. But I know most of you know the many ways to take advantage of all that Hillwood has to offer as a member. You're the first to know about programs, and that's actually really important. Um, and I'll just give you a little secret. If you check the website and sign up for the programs before the email blast goes out, you're uh, more likely to be able to get a seat because once the email blast goes out, you have about three hours <laughs> before it sells out. I'm not kidding. But you get, of course, special access to programs and discounts in the shop. I know a lot of you were taking advantage of that. And also in the cafe. You may not know that. You get a 20% discount in the cafe as well. Yes. Just saying. Just saying. So I, I really can't thank you enough for all of your uh, support for Hillwood. I really appreciate it. And I hope you'll continue to spread your, the word to your friends about becoming a Hillwood member. And our membership chair is right here in front. Yes, so she, she's happy to talk to you about it. So it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Many of uh, you already know him quite well. Dr. Wilfred Zeisler is our chief curator and co-chair of all the exhibitions at Hillwood. He's a graduate of the Sorbonne University and the Ecole du Louvre in Paris. He's written extensively on French and Russian decorative arts, including a 2010 book on ceramics and, and a number of articles. At Hillwood in 2015, he curated Splendor and Surprise, Elegant Containers Antique to Modern, and in 2016, Konstantin Makovsky, the Tsar's Painter. 
He also contributed to last year's Friends in Fashion, an American diplomat in 1820s Russia, as well as this year's The Artistic Table. In addition to curating Fabergé Rediscovered, Wilfred wrote the extraordinary companion book of the same name, and he is very happy to sign copies uh, after the lecture. Please join me in welcoming Wilfred Zeisler. All right, thank you very much. I'm very happy to open this series of lecture series tonight with this first presentation dedicated to uh, Fabergé. Um, the program for tonight will be actually to tell you a bit more about uh, the firm of Fabergé and my plan is pretty easy. Uh, everything is in the title, business, clients and collectors. So I will start with the first part which will be dedicated to the business of the firm of Fabergé and then I will tell you more about the clients of Fabergé and finally more about the collectors of Fabergé. So very easy to see what we are uh, going to do tonight. So let's start with the first part, the business, uh, the firm of Fabergé. So Fabergé, as my accent send, sounds very French, uh, and it is originally was French. The Fabergé family uh, left actually France in the 17th century. They were Huguenots, and they had to leave uh, France when um, during the reign of Louis XIV. But actually, uh, when they became jewelers, they were more considered as Germans and even Russians more than just French. Um, and uh, this story regarding Fabergé as jewelers started with the father of the most famous of the Fabergés, which is Peter Carl Fabergé, but his father, Carl Gustav Fabergé, uh, Gustav Fabergé, which was born in 1814 and died in 1894, was the founder of the firm of Fabergé in St. Petersburg. And he opened actually a first shop uh, in St. Petersburg in 1842, which was located in the center of the luxury good industry in St. Petersburg, not so far from the Nevsky Prospect, which was his, his famous avenue, so on Bolshaya Moskaya, which was one of the most uh, luxurious like avenue in St. Petersburg. But um, the firm became particularly famous in the second half of the 19th century when actually Gustav's son, Carl Peter Fabergé, and his brother Agathon took over the business in the 1870s, 1880s. So Carl Fabergé was born in 1846 and died in 1920. Here is a photo of Carl Fabergé working at his desk. And he, of course, began to uh, his training as a jeweler, as a jeweler in his father's workshop in St. Petersburg, and also he was not only trained as a jeweler, but he was also trained as a businessman. And he um, was trained as a businessman and studying economy in St. Petersburg, but also later on traveling all over Europe. In the 1860s, actually, Peter Carl Fabergé was sent out uh, through Europe. He traveled a lot. Uh, we don't have so much of details of when and where and in what order he did this trip over Europe, but this is how he completed his actually training. So here is a map showing you where he went during the 60s uh, all over Europe, so St. Petersburg on the top right. He went first to Dresden where his father actually has retired in 1860, where he will meet with him and continue part of his training. He will also go to Frankfurt in Germany where he was apprenticed to the very famous local jeweler Friedman. He will of course go to Paris, the capital of jewelry and good taste, to Italy. <laughs> and to London as well. So while Fabergé was traveling, actually, he was not only completing his training as a businessman and a jeweler, but also was using his time to visit historic collections, museums, to take just inspiration of all the treasures that you could visit in um, uh, European museums of that time. And one of the very important museums he visited uh, in Dresden, Germany, was actually the famous uh, Green Vaults, so the Grüne Gewölbe, which were like where the, the, the Saxony court had gathered the treasures of the Saxony family, including a lot of jewelry, and this was open as a public museum, so, and of course, Fabergé would go there, look into the objects, and look at these historic jewelry pieces and works of art. And we know for sure that this visit had a great, you know, um, 
influence on his work because we know that he directly copied actually pieces from that collection to create one of his famous imperial easter eggs so on the top right for example you have the 18th century model from the Green Vault that Fabergé had seen and on the bottom left you have the Fabergé egg, uh, imperial egg that he did in 1894, the Renaissance egg, which is actually an exact copy of the piece that he had seen uh, in this museum. And uh, so that's how he will, you know, develop his knowledge about history of, uh, history of design, history of, uh, of styles and go over all of all over Europe. So he will visit, of course, Germany, the Green Vaults, he will go to London as well. And London was very important for him, not only because of the business he could see there, but also because in 1862, while he was traveling, London had organized one of the very important world fairs in the 19th century. So world fairs were arranged and organized in Europe since 1851. They were very important moment and exhibitions international exhibition where actually um, industry, industrialists, uh, businessmen, jewelers, artists will come and show their art and it was fantastic for jewelers like Fabergé especially during his training to go there and see what was happening, what was you know the new trend, the new fashion and in 1862 he was there most likely because he was an apprentice to Friedman, this jeweler from Frankfurt so and we know that Friedman was had a display in this World Fair in London in 1862 so most likely that's how Fabergé ended up being there and among the treasures he may have seen was this piece, which is one of the pieces that Melerio di Miller, a very famous French jeweler who was found in the 17th century, which, still, which is still in activity today, had displayed uh, many treasures, including this amazing brooch, uh, enamel showing how actually French uh, jewelers in the 1860s already mastered the art of enamel, the art of you know naturalistic design and so on. That will, of course, um, that why um, that was. Um, style and techniques that Fabergé will become famous for uh, a few decades later. So the kind of thing that he will look at. So while he was traveling, Fabergé was not only looking to the historic models that were into the museums and collections he could visit, but also what his contemporaries, jewelers, his competitors were actually producing and creating at that time. So, of course, uh, he went also to Paris to see the collections and, you know, what was happening there. And then we, when he went back to, um, to, to, to Russia, so it was in the 60s, he would, like, go back to his father's uh, shop and then take, um, enter the, the, the management of the shop in 1872 and with his brother Agathon, who had a similar training as well. So starting in 1882, both will took over the business and, become to, and start to manage it. And actually, this is a very important time because Fabergé became particularly famous when both brothers, Peter Carl and Agathon, took over the business. So, of course, to develop the business, they will uh, display a lot of objects in different exhibitions, national exhibitions, but also international exhibitions, just to showcase, to make them more famous, to show what they were producing. And one very important exhibition was the one which was organized in Moscow in 1882. This exhibition was very important because it was a sort of like had a national support uh, supported by the emperor and the imperial family because it was a way to showcase to the world in this exhibition in Moscow how the luxury good industry and the Russian industry in general was had developed and was very successful and so Fabergé it was the first very important exhibition he took part in and here is a, a print of the display had he had presented the jewelry he had presented the gold jewelry he had presented to this show in 1882 and actually he was um, he caught the eyes of the press but also of the empress which was more important than the press um, uh, because he was copying actually a lot of uh, treasures that um, antique treasures antique jewelry gold jewelry that had just been found during excavation organized in south of Russia at that time in Crimea especially and they had found a lot of treasures which enter the hermitage you can still uh, visit see them at the hermitage and Fabergé at that time was also uh, had volunteered to become like an appraiser and worked at the hermitage so he had access to these objects so he had the idea to actually copy these pieces of jewelry and to showcase them uh, at this exhibition uh, in 
1882 in Moscow. And also actually the taste for antique jewelry was something which was a big fashion and a big trend in Paris and in Italy in the 60s. So 20 years earlier when actually Fabergé was traveling in Western Europe. So actually it was mixing which was trendy right now in Russia because of this new discovery, this new excavation and what he had seen 20 years earlier in France. And so it was a big success. Uh, here on the top right you have a very rare example of a piece by Fabergé which was most likely uh, presented or similar to the pieces that he had presented to this uh, exhibition for this exhibition in 1882 and uh, which is in the McFerrin collection in Houston and uh, so Fabergé as I said caught the eyes of the Empress because the Emperor and the Empress and the Imperial family came to, inner, to you know, inaugurate the exhibition and Empress Maya, the wife of Emperor Alexander III, was really known for her taste for jewelry, loved jewelry, liked it, bought a few pieces and here was the beginning of actually Fabergé becoming known among the Imperial family. And the success will continue and of course the beginning of the real success story of the Fabergé firm starts a few years after in 1885 when he delivered the first Easter imperial egg and I will tell you more about this imperial eggs but I wanted to show you the first one which is in St. Petersburg at the Fabergé Museum which was formerly in the Forbes collection in New York so it really looks like an egg as you can see uh, was a typical you know object that you will present for Easter eggs has always been Eggs have always been a symbol of rebirth, renewal, sort of a spring, sort of Easter. So it's like a gold egg covered with white enamel. So it looks like an egg and the size of an egg. And when you open an egg, the egg, of course, you have a yolk. And in the yolk, you have a little chicken. And in the chicken, which is made of gold and with ruby diamonds, you had actually a final surprise, which is lost now. And this was actually the idea of Emperor Alexander III, who uh, wanted to please his wife and had seen a similar piece from the 18th century in the Danish collection and his wife was born Danish, um, Dagmar from Denmark and so he had the idea of creating, of commissioning this egg, um, copying this model from the Danish collection and Fabergé was commissioned with it and Fabergé delivered it and the emperor and the empress were pleased and after that every year Fabergé will deliver an egg uh, for uh, the emperor to present to his wife. So that's how, I mean, the, the, the firm became particularly famous. So the headquarters of the firm were actually in St. Petersburg and with the fame and the growth of the firm, um, so it was decided that the old shop that was founded by the father in 1842 was becoming too small, too complicated, the firm was growing, had a lot of uh, subcontractors, workers and so on, so it was decided that they will build a new shop and workshop. So here is the facade of the building which was commissioned in 1898, inaugurated in 1900. So on the left you have so the, the facade which still exists in St. Petersburg, same address, Bolshaya Morskaya, this street of you know, lo local luxury good industry and here you have a photo of the shop, how it looked like during the time of uh, Fabergé. And so um, we will now explore how the, pro the process of the creation of the object made by Fabergé, so in this kind of like uh, headquarters of St. Petersburg. So of course everything started in the studio, so Fabergé was a genius, you know, businessman. He was surrounded by uh, an army of uh, drawers, um, um, designers, um, workmasters and so on. And um, so first of all you will start with an ID. So of course you had like a lot of historic objects and that you could use as source of inspiration and when you will have uh, you know settle on a sort of like model so you will start to create a drawing so here you have example of some of the drawings which were like presented and approved uh, in the studio and here you have a example of a drawing which actually match uh, an object which was produced by the firm of Fabergé and uh, in the exhibition here and here at Hillwood one of the new information that we share in the catalog and in the exhibition is the fact that we actually own a selection of uh, drawings from the Fabergé firm and workshops which were acquired by the museum in the 1980s. Here are examples of pieces of jewelry, um, small you know brooches and pins um, and you can see what I like about these drawings that you have like little crosses so it means that most likely these were the models that were approved or like decided to be produced or chosen by the commissioner so it's a really interesting so that's the beginning an ID 
you make it, you make a drawing, and then they have to go to the workshop. So the workshop uh, Fabergé where I had like, as I said, a lot of workers, workmasters, specialists, and the workshops were supervised by head workmasters. So when you have a Fabergé piece in your hands, you have the Russian hallmarks of silver or gold, then you have um, the, the Russian hallmark, sorry, then you have the Fabergé fur mark, and then you have the mark of the head workmaster. And you have three Success three successive um, head workmaster. The first one was Eric Collin from 1872 to 1886, then Mikhail Perkin from 1886 to 1903, the most famous one, and then Henrik Rickström from 1903 to 1917. So usually you attribute a piece by Fabergé um, to the firm and then to you know one of the head workmaster, but there is no way to know who actually did the pieces because each piece will go through a goldsmith, a silversmith, a jeweler, an enameler, and so on. So all these workmasters, which were supervised by the head workmasters and the final work approved by the head of the firm, Karl Fabergé himself. So of course the firm became particularly famous because of the love of Fabergé for French techniques and 18th century style and models and they were particularly fashionable and here you have example of how he mastered uh, enamel technique. Enamel is a glass-like composition and especially the guilloche which is uh, this example you have here from objects which are in the exhibition. So the surface of the precious metal is engraved and then it's covered by a layer of enamel which is colored and translucent and so because it's translucent you can see the surface of the metal which has this like wonderful design which is called like the guilloche enamel so you can see it on these different details and that made the firm particularly famous and this all was inspired by 18th century French most likely uh, techniques and design that made him so famous and gold work also was important and look at this detail here. These garlands are colorful. As you can see, they are made of uh, four color gold, so green, yellow, white, and pink, which are like the four color gold technique, which was also very popular in the 18th century. So that made, of course, Fabergé particularly famous, and also because he was able to produce objects which was perfect, you know, use for everyday luxury for the clientele who will, you know, need all of these objects for your for their everyday life. So you want to frame your friends, your member of your family, all these photos that you have, photos which were so fashionable at that time. Um, here an example, Fabergé will do frames from the very precious ones to more simple ones, sometimes using wood, at uh, this example. Uh, which is in the exhibition and from our collection featuring uh, Grand Duchess Maria Nikolaevna, the photographer who was the daughter of, Empress, uh, of Emperor Nikolai I. So frames, of course, you needed frames. You needed also a menu holder, uh, as you can see on the left, because how would you know what you will eat if you don't have a menu and then a menu holder? So that's um, an example of this kind of like little objects that made Fabergé so famous. And then, of course, uh, smoking was really fashionable, even for women in Russia at that time. So uh, cigarette cases was also very cigarette cases were also very popular, and all the smoking accessories. So pieces here from our collection, which are also in the exhibition. And little boxes and objects like the bell push on the left. Um, and what is pretty interesting about this selection of boxes and bell pushes is showing you here how Fabergé was also using um, using um, hearthstone to create these precious objects. And um, so you have a bell push on the left which is using nephrite, which is a Russian jade, um, and which was of course very popular. It was electrified, it was working with electricity, so it was also reflecting the new technologies that were very highly appreciated in Russia at that time. Um, and then on the right, the box you have uh, is in our collection with nephrite in the exhibition. And it's like in this look, kind of like Louis XV style. And what I like about this one, it's exactly the same design as the one on the left in rock crystal, uh, which belonged to King Farouk of Egypt. And it's exactly the same design, but because the same design is used uh, with two is is used to create two objects with two different materials, one in nephrite, one in rock crystal. They, both objects are identical, but they are very different as well. So it shows you also uh, how designs can you know be reused and reused, but because you change the material, the objects are very, look very different. And of course, Fabergé was also producing objects which were like 
which were typically Russian, such as the use of hearthstone. Uh, here you have an example of the little, little animals, um, like this little rabbit, which was, um, made, is made of uh, amethyst with Ruby's eyes, and you can see he holds a little egg uh, in his um, legs. And uh, this was most likely a little present for Easter, and it's from our collection, so that made also Fabergé particularly famous, using all these like minerals and stones that were like coming from uh, Ural and Siberia, so all these like natural resources from Russia. And also exquisite object which has no use and pearly decorative, uh, which were very, very successful and made Fabergé so famous, like these flowers uh, that we could call today permanent botanicals, uh, <laughs> but made of gold and enamel and precious stone in a rock crystal vase, which is um, carved so that it looked like it's filled with water. With water. So that was for the, the example of the kind of production you will have in the St. Petersburg headquarters, in the workshops, but Fabergé with the success and growth of the firm will also open branches all over Russia, uh, starting with Moscow in 1887. So here the photo of the former shop of Fabergé in Moscow which um, actually, as it was in Petersburg, was located in the luxury, sort of like good industry uh, area of Moscow, Kuznetsky Most, where all the local jewelers, but also foreign jewelers, had their shops and workshops, so it was perfectly well located. And in Moscow, actually, you could, it, the production was a bit different. Uh, it was more like a kind of mass production for some of the uh, objects. So some of them you could choose, actually, you could choose on catalogs. And here is like, one of the rare catalog of the production of the firm of Fabergé in Moscow, where you could choose between different kind of pieces of jewelry and silver sets, uh, as you can see on these pages. And we have actually in our collection, currently on display on the breakfast room table, um, so example of this silver uh, ware production from Moscow uh, by Fabergé, like this coffee set. But Moscow was also the symbol of old Russia, so the production of Fabergé there was also very oriented um, and influenced by this style. So this is where you will find objects uh, often made in collaboration with jewelers specialized in such uh, design and techniques like Fedor Rukert. Um, so this is a good example on view in the loan for the exhibition, but on view in the house in the pavilions, so showing the, you know, sort of like casket covered with like this enamel in a Russian taste with Russian ornament inspired by folklore and historic Russian motifs and with a lead uh, in enamel uh, featuring a detail, I mean, a reproduction of our famous painting, so a Boyer Wedding Feast by Konstantin Makovsky, which is like one of the very famous examples of this taste for Russian history and Russian, you know, motifs, and um, this, which is reproduced on the top of this lid. Uh, which is pretty interesting about the success of our painting is actually that our painting uh, was already in the US in 1885, so when that casket was made, the painting was already far away from Russia, but it shows you how this painting was famous at that time. And of course, Moscow is not, was not only at that time only the symbol of uh, you know, old Russia, but it was also the symbol of modern Russia with new wealth and new taste. And this is where you had like collectors such as Morozov or Shukin, uh, collecting, you know, avant-garde, Russian avant-garde, French avant-garde, so it was also a perfect location to produce objects inspired by modern uh, design, inspired by Western European motif, such as the French Art Nouveau, which is this, which with its naturalistic design, and here you have a very good example of that taste with this bloodstone box, which is in our exhibition as well, from our collection, with this box in the shape of a leaf, and the box itself is um, uh, set with gold leaves in the same you know, naturalistic design. And uh, in addition to Moscow, Pit, um, P. Fabergé had also opened, you know, little uh, shops in Kiev and Odessa. So it was really a way to, uh, you know, um, develop your um, 
production and also to target you know a diverse um, clientele and the main symbol of the success of Fabergé was actually to open a, a, a branch in London in 1903 so it was a way, of course, to compete with the local jewelers and especially the French jewelers. I mean, he never went to Paris, it was too risky for him. But in London, it was a way uh, to be uh, present in Western Europe. And he will showcase in the shop in, in London, actually, example of objects that were produced in Petersburg and especially pieces that you couldn't find in other shops than in, at Fabergé, especially pieces made of hard stone. And this... Um, the fact that Fabergé was in London was also uh, supported by the fact that uh, the Queen of England, Alexandra, was actually the sister of Empress Maya of Russia. So it had like very good support and connection. And actually, uh, this little figurine of a sailor was uh, originally acquired by a member of the imperial family, but who was living in London at that time. And this uh, opening of the London branch uh, didn't please actually Empress Maya. She wrote to Queen Alexandra in 1906, uh, 1906, sorry, quote, Now that that silly Fabergé has his shop in London, you have everything and I can't send you anything new, so I am furious. <laughs> And of course, one of the clients of the branch uh, Fabergé in London was Queen Alexandra. Here you have a fantastic portrait of her by François Flamand, the French portraitist. And here a selection on the left, left the portrait of Empress Maria, which was produced in Petersburg by Fabergé, which was presented by Maria to her sister, so before Fabergé opened. And then good example of objects, you know, another example of this like permanent botanicals or Fabergé flowers and little animals that actually uh, Queen Alexandra bought from the branch of uh, Fabergé in London. So showing uh, that actually the target for Fabergé was really the uh, court uh, in England when they opened uh, in uh, London. So uh, this slide is a perfect transition to my next part, which is dedicated to the client clients of the firm of Fabergé. So there is a very interesting and funny quote about, you know, uh, the how Fabergé managed orders um, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So, of course, objects which were produced in the workshops of Fabergé were some of them um, for the stock, so for the shop. But now, since we are speaking about clients, we will mostly speak about special commissions. And this quote relates to actually how Fabergé took special commissions. It came from the memoir of Franz Birbaum, who was one of the main designers of Fabergé. So speaking of Fabergé, so quote, he was, who he is, Karl Fabergé. He was always in a hurry and often forgot the details. He would ask all around his employees, looking for anyone who had been standing near him at the time. He was always amazed that anyone standing near could not remember anything. <laughs> Among the employees, there was, wa there was a saying that the person responsible for the order was not the one who took it, but the one who was standing nearby. <laughs> End of quote. And I love this quote because it shows you how the workshop could have been busy and someone is coming in and Fabergé is doing something else but it's an important client and so on. So among the clients of Fabergé um, we could make two um, or three distinctions. Um, the first one will um, relate to the official commissions. So Fabergé uh, when, when he delivered the first um, imperial Easter egg in 1885 became the same year official supplier to the Russian court. And this was very important for a jeweler such as Fabergé, who was not the only one, because meaning that if you were the supplier to the Russian court, every year you were guaranteed that you would get a lot of commissions. Because part of the role of the Ministry of the Court was to organize and arrange you know, a system of rewards where when you did something good for the court, for the power, or during a state visit or a diplomatic visit, you will receive a present from different, from different kinds. So every year the minister of the court will commission so, um, the jewelers um, different kind of object, rings, frames, boxes, and so on, to be distributed to, um, along, I mean, along the year. 
and uh, the main uh, presents were actually presentation boxes and here is an example of a very typical presentation box made by Fabergé with a miniature of Emperor Alexander III and with as you can see big diamonds so they were also very get, great uh, cash reserve for the people who received such a gift and this one was actually presented to a French um, Admiral, Admiral Gervais in 1894 when he attended officially the um, funerals of Emperor Alexander III in St. Petersburg, so he received this gift as a sort of like commemoration. And in the show and in our collection we have this uh, pin which has also a very nice little diamond as you can see it is in the shape of the double eared eagle which is a symbol of imperial russia and this pin or brooch uh, was actually presented in 1901 uh, during a state visit of emperor nikolai the first Nicolas II, sorry, and Empress Alexandra to Dunkirk in north of France during an official state visit, which took uh, part, which took, um, which was one of the many visits between France and Russia at the time uh, when they had like this very strong alliance. But what is more interesting for us are actually the commissions that made a member of the imperial family. So we cannot go over all the members of the imperial family who commissioned Fabergé, but just like just have a look to a few of those. Uh, one of the main clients of Fabergé was Grand Duke Alexei Alexandrovich. He was one of the brothers of Alexander III. He was an art connoisseur. He loved um, 18th century French art and he was a good collector of, uh, a, a, a good client of Fabergé and other jewelers. Here is a portrait of him uh, by Konstantin Makovsky, which is in the Orsay Museum in Paris. And in our collection, we have this candlestick to the right, which is in a French style, which makes perfect sense regarding the taste of Grand Duke. And uh, we know that it was part of his collection from his palace in St. Petersburg. And I show it next to this uh, fan, which was not his fan for sure, um, but which is a good example of a production of a fan by Fabergé, and which we know was owned by Balletta. And Balletta was a dancer from the Imperial uh, Theater, and she was one of the many mistresses of Grand Duke Alexei. So we assume that actually the fan was presented to her as many other objects by Fabergé she had um, because she was, uh, yeah, they were together. <laughs> so um, this is a good example of the kind of object that you will buy. So something for your, you know, palace, your collection and something for your lover. And as you will see, a lot of objects um, that we are commissioned from Fabergé, but member of the imperial family. We are token of love and affections. Here it actually revealing a sort of like story which was not necessarily official, but often you have official love stories which are told through the objects. Here you have one of our masterpieces, um, a music box, by Fab music box by Fabergé in the French 18th century style, which was commissioned in 1907 to commemorate the 25th wedding anniversary of Prince Felix and Zinaide Yusupov, F and Z. So here is Felix and here is Zinaida. So for their 25th wedding anniversary in 1907, their sons decided to present them with this Fabergé box. So Yusupovs were among the wealthiest aristocrats of Russia at that time. And if you look closely to the box, the back of the box has two other initials, the N and the F. These are for like Nikolai and Felix, the two sons who commissioned the box to be presented to their parents for their 25th wedding anniversary. So next time you have a 25th wedding anniversary, you know what you want to get. <laughs> and the box is actually a music box. Each side of the box is actually decorated with um, enamel things showing the main houses of the Yusuf Buffs. So it shows you how wealthy they were. As here you have their main home in, in Petersburg, the Yusupov Palace. Here it's there because you need a villa in the suburb of Petersburg. Here is their villa. Here is their um, their uh, estate in the suburb of Moscow. Here is their palace in Moscow and the uh, little house in Crimea and another estate, uh, I think, in Ukraine. So a nice present and uh, if you go to the exhibition you can even listen to the sound of this music box which still work. And for the same event, so I just showed you, you know, the present of the sons to the parents, so the husband has also to present a gift to his wife and here it is 
on loan from the Sandoz Foundation. You can see it in the exhibition. Um, so the what we call sometimes the Yusuf of Egg, which is actually a clock in the shape of an egg, which was presented for the same event. That's why you have the 25 here uh, by Prince Felix uh, to his wife Zinaida for their 25th wedding anniversary in 1907. And originally actually didn't have this monogram. This monogram is from the actual owner of the piece who actually removed the miniatures which were the portraits of the husband and of the two sons uh, when it was presented to the wife. That's how you did in the 20th century when you were a collector. So, um, of course, our main uh, clients will be Alexander the, the Emperor and the Empress themselves. So let's start with Alexander III you have on the left and his wife, Empress Maya, on the right. Uh, and we will mostly speak about what they are famous for, the, the famous <coughs> imperial Easter eggs. So as I mentioned earlier, Alexander III had the first the idea of commissioning an imperial egg in 1895 and Fabergé was commissioned to do so. Here it is again. And it was very successful because after that, every year Fabergé would deliver an egg to the Empress. So in total, you have 50 eggs which were made, plus two in 1917 which was never delivered. And uh, here is the first one from 1885. So Empress Maria will get after that one several eggs. I cannot show you all the eggs because some of them are missing. We are still looking for seven. Uh, and I have only a selection to show you tonight, including the one which made the headlines a few years ago, the new discovered egg, which was found in the Midwest in the flea market in 2014. Yes, he made a, bi he made a great deal. Uh, <laughs> So this egg was identified as being the third imperial egg, whose surprise was actually uh, ho uh, uh, hiding a watch, as you can see uh, in it, uh, which was made by Vacheron Constantin, a very famous watchmaker, and which was uh, identified as the third imperial Easter egg. And next time you go to a flea market, uh, <laughs> look into, uh, this is like the one that everyone is like looking for right now. Uh, missing egg, which is the one from 1889, and just recently it was identified in this old photograph, and it's the only photo we know of that egg, which was presented by uh, Alexander III to his wife in 1889. So we know now how it looks like, but we don't know where it is. So that's a tradition, as I said, that started with Alexander III in 1885 and continued. And in 1894, actually, so that's why I show you Nikolai II and Alexandra on this little uh, brooch. In uh, 1894, Alexander III died suddenly, and um, it happened during the fall. And most likely, when the emperor died, uh, the actually Easter egg that Fabergé had planned for the following years was already in production because we estimate that uh, Fabergé would have needed about six months to one year to create such an exquisite piece. And a few, sometimes after the death, you know, of Alexander III, when Nicolas II became emperor, it was decided that actually for the following Easter, Fabergé wouldn't create one egg but two. So you can imagine how the jeweler was most likely in a hurry and uh, didn't know how to manage that because that year he had to do two. And that's pretty interesting because. We have on loan here uh, at the exhibition the blue serpent clock egg, which is actually the first one that Nicolai II presented to his mother in 1895. And maybe because it was like a last minute commission, that may explain why it's so simple. I mean, it's very exquisite, very elaborate, but the only surprise on this egg is the fact that it's actually a clock. And you can see it immediately, that's a clock. And the design is actually very traditional. It's inspired by 18th century models and was presented so to Empress Maya. And the same year, um, Empress Alexandra got her first egg from her husband, Nicolas II, and here it is in the Fabergé Museum, the uh, rosebud egg. And who's surprised is it's like um, a rose, a yellow rose you can see um, in the egg. The year after, actually, Fabergé had more time to think about his egg, which needed to be presented by Nicolas II to his mother, which is our famous 12 monogram egg, you can see in the exhibition, which is a very beautiful egg and a very touching, actually, story because it's a present of the son to the mother to commemorate the deaths of the father and husband. 
The egg itself is completely covered with the monograms of the two, Alexander III here and Empress Maya Fedorovna. And inside the egg, you had a surprise, which we know now it's a new discovery that was made and which is shared with the public in the exhibition and in the book. Um, was a little set uh, of frames, miniature frames, with 10 sapphire, 5 sapphire on each side, which inside we know, unfortunately they are lost now, featured actually six different portrait miniature of Emperor Alexander III. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Empress Maya got it, she was very happy. She was um, in South of France and she was very touched by it. She responded to her um, son by his by these words in march 1896 uh, quote i can find words to express to you my dear nikki how touched and moved i was on receiving your ideal egg with the charming portraits of your dear adored papa it is all such a beautiful idea with our monograms above it all and i thank you for it from the bottom of my soul you have given me an emotional joy and it touches me more than i can say end of quote so definitely she was pleased with this egg. Yes. Same year, um, Nicholas II presents this egg to his wife on the right. Um, you can see the rock crystal egg with revolving miniatures. Each miniature actually features different residences related to the story and the life of Empress Alexandra. And on the left, I just wanted to show you that piece uh, from the Green Vault in Dresden. So it shows you how actually Fabergé always um, kind of like used as source of inspiration some of the historic pieces he had seen during his uh, trip. Uh, in Europe. Of course, every year you have an egg, so I cannot show you all of them, so I will just show you this one from 1914, which is very important for us because it's one of Marjorie's um, two imperial eggs that she um, had in her collection, the, the um, Catherine the Great egg, which was presented by Nicholas II to his mother in 1914, which is completely dedicated to um, Catherine the Great and the art and science that was that were patronized by Empress Catherine the Great of Russia and the surprise which is still missing today uh, was a lit little miniature of Empress Alexand of Empress Ca Catherine the Great in a sedan chair as you can see which is privately owned but was not possible to come here. So as I said, these eggs continue until 1916. The 1917 ones were never delivered. And until the early 20th century, the imperial Easter eggs were actually private matters. They were only kept in the private apartments of the imperial family. And just to give you a sense, and I will show you a few slides, I mean, there is already a lot of info. Oh, I forgot this one, sorry. That's just to give you a uh, 1914, this is the one that was presented by Nikolai II to his wife. The mosaic egg, which is in a royal collection. So I wanted to say that, so they were private matters, so just to give you a sense, and we can consider uh, the emperor and the empress already being collectors of imperial Easter eggs. So this is the eggs of Empress Alexandra. Here, this is a winter palace, and all these eggs you have featured here, including a few that I show you today, were in this case, in this, private, in this um, room, in the private apartment of uh, Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra. And in their um, uh, residence, the Alexander Palace, they were in this case. And here are all the eggs you could see, can see in this case in 1912. So it just shows you how they were actually displayed. And it's only in 1900 that actually these pieces became uh, public matters. They were um, lent to the Fabergé exhibition. I mean, Fabergé presented some of his uh, works at the World Fair in Paris in 1900, the Paris Exposition, and it included 14 imperial eggs lent by Empress Maya and Empress Alexandra and other treasures from the family, including this clock from our collection, which belonged to Empress Maya. So starting in 1900, the imperial East eggs became to, to, to be better known or became public matters. And even in Russia in 1902, for a charity event, the imperial family decided to display their treasures, including a lot of their Fabergé items for a special exhibition at the Van der Wies Palace in St. Petersburg called the Van der Wies Exhibition. It was to raise money for schools uh, for charity patronized by Empress Alexandra. And each member of the imperial family had their own case where they showed their treasures by Fabergé. Here is just 
the case of Empress Maria and all her eggs and objects, including a few from Hillwood, which were shown at that show in 1902. So you see our uh, egg here, the new discovered one, and our clock. And here is the uh, Empress Alexandra's um, a case for the same exhibition. So you can see the newspapers will cover the events. So the eggs became kind of famous. And of course, eggs had always been very highly appreciated in Russia. But um, people started to, you know, wanted to have same kind of objects than the imperial family. And that's how you started to have imperial, I mean, Easter eggs, which were not imperial. And so, for example, just to give you a sense, on the left you have one of the imperial eggs which was presented to um, Empress Maria by Nicolai II, the cockerel egg, in 1900. So as soon as the model was kind of like presented to the emperor and the empress, so Fabergé could reuse it somehow because the imperial family had the exclusivity of the model. And in the center, this egg, which is not imperial but very similar, is the one which was um, commissioned by um, Beatrice Efrosi de Rothschild. It's known as the Rothschild egg, which is now at the Hermitage from 1902. And on the right, this is one of the many eggs, seven actually, that Barbara Kelsch, wh whose money came from the gold mining in Siberia, uh, commissioned, I mean, got from her husband, but using her, um, her money. Um, <laughs> as gifts for Easter, and she had seven. So just showing you that the eggs becoming public matters, people started to commission similar pieces from themselves. Well, the war and revolution, it's time, because I see the time is flying. Um, so with the First World War, uh, the firm of Fabergé, of course, didn't go very well. A lot of workers um, had to go to the war. The taste was not for luxury good anymore. And so these are the kind of things that were produced by Fabergé, among others, like this copper tea glass holder, which commemorates the first year of the First World War. And then, of course, the, break of, the breakout of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Uh, put an end to the Fabergé era and to the Russian Empire. So here is a photo of the constellation uh, egg, which was never accomplished and finished, which was uh, a present which was planned for Easter 1917 from uh, Nicholas II to his uh, wife, Alexandra, which is now in Russia, in Moscow, but uh, which was never delivered. And with the revolution, of course, came a new regime who uh, decided to sell off a lot of uh, heritage which belonged to the imperial family and from the old regime. And here you have a very clear fo a photo of you know, one of the inventory of the Russian, of the treasures of the imperial family, which includes a lot of Fabergé eggs and a nuptial crown also that we know very well because it's in our collection, uh, that were selected to be sold to um, during sales or to agents or dealers, which will later become uh, leaders in the um, market of Fabergé and Russian works of art. So time for collectors, and I will be very quick. Um, of course, um, this object will so leave Russia progressively, some of them living with their owners who escaped the revolution and saving some of their objects, other ones being sold by the new regime and being acquired by dealers or agents who will, sold them, uh, who will sell them um, abroad. Among the collectors who, especially in the US, started to collect Fabergé pieces, we have mostly women, including on the right, one woman we know very well, Marjorie Post, who was a leader of the collection of Fabergé. On the left, Lilian Pratt, who actually um, bequested her collection to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, who was a big collector of Fabergé. Matilda Getting Gray, on the left, uh, from uh, Louisiana, whose collection was, is now partly on view at the Met in New York, and India Early Minshall, uh, whose collection of Fabergé is at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Which is particularly interesting about this woman, they all started to buy in the early 30s, most likely from Armand Hammer, who actually had dealt directly with the Soviet government to bring object to, to, to the West. Um, but they started only in the early 30s. 
Queen Mary was also one of the uh, great collector in England of these pieces. She bought some of them from some of her relatives, including Ranches Vladimir, you can see on the right, who actually escaped with some of her treasures. And then they will sell this object to the court of England and to Queen Mary. And you have a few men as well, like Henry Walters, uh, founder of the Walters Museum in Baltimore, who is very special because he bought Fabergé pieces in the 30s, but before that, in 1900, he went to Petersburg and he bought pieces directly from the shop. Um, so more as a client, not e exactly as a collector already. King Farouk of Egypt in the center and the famous Malcolm Forbes on the left. And from Malcolm Forbes, I will move to Marjor go back to Marjorie Post because as I said, all the women I, I, I mentioned earlier started to collect in the 1930s. He, as a collector, started later, but he said that Marjorie Post was a pioneer in collecting Fabergé objects. And actually it's true that Marjorie Post in the US as a collector was one of the first to collect objects starting in the 1920s. And what is pretty interesting that when Forbes was collecting Fabergé, sometimes he was competing with Marjorie Post. Around the Renaissance egg you have here, when it was on the market in the 50s, 60s, it was kind of like offered or mentioned to Marjorie Post. And she noted, she noted, and that's pretty interesting, have noted, not interested now. So he bought it. And that's how it ended up in the Forbes collection, now in the Fabergé Museum, in the Fabergé in Petersburg. And you can see how these objects were sometimes used for advertisements in newspaper like Vogue magazine. And Marjorie Post was actually a pioneer of collecting Fabergé. She began in the 20s, so 10 years earlier, before she would actually go to Russia, she would actually start to you know, be interested in Russian culture. She met with Russian emigres in New York in the 20s and bought her first pieces directly from Russian immigrants, like this can handle by Fabergé that she bought in 1927. And that was actually owned by Grand Saxenia, as stated on this letter uh, that came in the collection with the objects. And then, of course, she will go to Russia in 1937-38, fell in love with Russian culture, continued to collect not only Fabergé but also Russian art, and create like Russian rooms where she will display her treasures. And as a collector of Fabergé, of course she needed a Fabergé case. Um, so we have one in the show, you can see here, and here was one of the first use of this case in one of her first uh, Russian room or icon room in the American embassy in Brussels where her husband, Joe Davis, who was first sent to Moscow, went as an ambassador uh, in Brussels, so in the th late 30s. Marjorie Post was also, the piece she bought, will also live with them and use them, and she will use many of the Fabergé frames to present herself or present members of her family, like Dina Merrill, who is featured three times here around her mother. All these frames are by Fabergé. And the clocks that Marjorie Post acquired were, now you can see them behind cases, but originally they were on view and displayed in the rooms, used as clocks to give you no time, because a clock is a clock. <laughs> and here she is, liking you know, to present her collection to visitors. And here's holding, she's holding like the clock that once, um, by Fabergé, that once was owned by Empress Maya. And I think that how Marjorie Post collected Fabergé piece is particularly interesting regarding the history of taste. And here is my last slide. Because this clock is featured in its original uh, context in the study of Empress Maria in 1897 and in Marjorie Post's French drawing over here at the world in the 60s. 1897-1960s, same taste. <laughs> French 18th century tapestry, French 18th century French furniture, some of it once owned by Queen Marie Antoinette, same story here. <laughs> Russian Empress, American Empress. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I think I may have a few minutes, even I was very long already, for a few questions. Yes? Do you think the uh, handbag she just recently passed, I think last year, uh, Judith Lieber, uh, remember she has the 
very ornate, the haute couture, handbag shaped like eggs. Do you think any of that design came oh. from our day? Well, uh, okay, the question is about like current like design in fashion accessories about, you know, copying like eggs or, you know, egg shape motif. I guess, yeah, and the question is like, is it inspired by Fabergé? I think yes. I mean, the egg shape in design and fashion industry is not new, but I think if I, I think it's like there is an inspiration because the eggs are particularly famous and iconic. So I'm sure there is some inspiration between both. So the question is about the Russian competitors of Fabergé, were they working in the same style or not? And actually, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, it's true, but as you have seen, I was already very long just on Fabergé, but we could do the same on many other competitors of Fabergé. Um, actually, a lot of jewelers, and not only uh, Russians, but also French and others from abroad, some of them were tr working in the same style. Some of them were as good as Fabergé. Even some of them, I would say, even better. Other ones were more specialized in other styles more in the Russian style and so on. Uh, so it really depends, but it was like really a trend and Fabergé represented a sort of like trend of fashion, but he was not the only one to do so. And he was not the only one to produce eggs, of course. And these one are particularly special because what we call the Fabergé Imperial Easter eggs are the eggs that were made by Fabergé for the emperor to be presented to his wife and later to his wife and mother. Yes? Well, I mean, regarding price, um, of, I mean, uh, if we know how much cost the uh, Fabergé eggs, uh, the early ones, so uh, regarding cost, um, I can just tell you that some of the uh, historic invoices have been found, uh, and so we have numbers. I don't remember them. I, I could, and sharing them with you will don't give you any information, but I, what I can tell you is that none of these objects I mean, you cannot compare with the prices of today, of course, but none of these objects at that time were cheap. They were all very expensive, very exquisite objects. So not everyone could afford such a neg, an elaborate piece. So it was really a piece of luxury, which really showed the luxury and the lavish life of the imperial court. What was the problem? You alluded to the fact that no, it's not a joke. The question is about why Fabergé didn't open a shop in France because he will, he couldn't. I mean, he could do it, but well, you know, you cannot compete with French jewelers in France. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, there is no way it would work. But he was actually, no, I mean, I'm a bit joking, but it's actually partly true. I mean, it was easier for him, actually, the idea of going to London, first of all, he had, he knew that he would have the support of the British court because of the connection with the imperial court. That's one reason. Second reason, it was because London was part of the cities that many of the wealthy Americans were visiting. And as we, we know through Henry Walters, but he's not the only one, some of the Americans, I mean, Petersburg started to become in the early 20th century, the kind of like place where you would go for a visit and so on. And you know, Fabergé had American clients in Petersburg. And so, and these also wealthy Americans were also traveling to Europe and to London. So it was a way also to just, you know, have a better access to this clientele. And then in London, you had not only the English, you know, jewelers, but also many French jewelers had opened shops there. So Boucheron, Chaumet, Cartier. So it was also a way to compete with them there. And then from London, it gave him like a base, you know, a sort of like location in Western Europe. So he will send agents to France and negotiate also with French clients um, from London uh, without having a, actually a shop in Paris. So it was a way also to get into France without having a shop there. But he also sold through Cartier, didn't he? Um, I mean, he didn't sell. I mean, the question was if Fabergé uh, d worked with Cartier, not exactly. So actually, Cartier and Fabergé were really competitors, uh, but they had the same. So Cartier was kind of like following the trend that uh, Fabergé started, especially with all the hearthstone objects, little animals and so on. So actually Fabergé, uh, Cartier went to Russia and had like, uh, went often to Russia, had big Russian clients. We, 
who mostly bought from Paris. But Cartier had also connection with um, uh, subcontractors, especially specialized in specific techniques such as enamel or hardstone, who also worked for, Cart for Fabergé. So that's how both kind of like dealt or sold the same kind of objects, but they were like really competitors. So they didn't work together for sure. But they had like, sometimes they were selling the same kind of object because they use the same um, supplier. Box that was your first. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so yes, so the connection Fabergé Cartier is in the actually in the sort of like as. Um, so that's what I explained right before was actually before the revolution, but after the revolution. So when objects by Fabergé started to appear on the market, especially objects saved by Russians who had left Russia with some of their belongings, uh, they will actually go to their former, you know, French jewelers and say, well, I have this and that, are you interested? And so, for example, that's how Prince Yusupov sold some of his heirlooms to Cartier, who actually knew that Marjorie Post will be interested, you know, into to these kind of objects and that's how she bought a few pieces by, Fa by Fabergé but also other kind of like treasures from Yusupov family through Cartier. So that's very interesting that Marjorie Post bought her first Fabergé pieces thanks to Cartier <laughs> because she was a great client of Cartier at that time. All right, yes? So how involved uh, were the father and then then his two sons, the brothers, in the actual production of the work produced in the shops. Was it just the design component? Was there actually some you know, technical production? Was it really only with the high-end clients, like the imperial family, etc.? So how would the Fabergé themselves were involved in the process of creation? So both uh, the two brothers and then after Peter Carl Fabergé, his own sons were also involved in the business. So they were all trained as jewelers and also as businessmen. And it's really like a model which was typical for this kind of like big jewelry firms in the 19th century. So they were like knowledgeable, they will supervise somehow the process, everything, approve the drawings, approve the objects when they were finalized, but they wouldn't, you know, craft anything from their hands. Uh, I would say that some of the Fabergé members were designers, so they will do the drawings, but not necessarily create the objects themselves. And regarding, uh, of course, they are salesmen and, you know, and agents and so on, so they won't deal with all of the clients. But of course, when it was, you know, when the emperor wanted something, you will go there and it will, you won't send the salesman, you will go yourself. So, I mean, Fabergé will meet with some of the best clients and negotiate, you know, the special commission then. Yes? Is there anyone licensed today to produce Fabergé? So, license of Fabergé today. So, what happened after the revolution? So, as uh, you know, and all the assets of the Fabergé family and Fabergé firms, as all the sort of like private businesses were confiscated and had to close with the Russian Revolution. So Fabergé did so and with his strong, because of his strong connection to the imperial family, he felt that he and his family were kind of like threatened to stay in Russia. So they left, they went to Western Europe, Switzerland, and then he died there and he's buried in South of France. And some member of his family actually started to restart sort of like business in Paris in the 2030s, which kind of like worked. Um, and then different members of the family, I mean, the brand was divided and they were like different names. It was used for different purposes for perfume and so on. Uh, and kind of like recently, I mean, all the right to use a name were bought by a um, business. And now, so it's like, Fabergé exists again and it's uh, based, I mean, in the US, in London and so on. But like with a gap between 1917 and nowadays. Yes? Maybe a little bit off topic, but where did Yusupov get his money? <laughs> so, well, where the money came from, from the Yusupov. So I uh, don't have all the details, but I mean, they were like one of the, the Yusupov family. Um, they were among the main um, owner of like a land in Russia, so they had a lot of estates and also they were owners of many um, homes and real estate uh, in Moscow and Petersburg and also they had a lot of interest in local industries and so on, so that's how where the wealth came from. It's very typical for many of these very wealthy, you know, uh, Russian aristocratic families, so mostly land and rent um, real estate and industry sometimes. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.